Okay, so for our last section, what I want to talk about is this idea of curiosity and why it's important for continuing to learn um, and continuing to develop skills as an R programmer and as a program evaluator. Um, one of the most common questions I get at the end of every semester are these two here. Um, what class should I do next and what book should I read next? How do I keep learning this stuff? Um, and what I say is those aren't the questions you should be asking. Um, there, are, there aren't really other classes you can take. Um, here in the Andrew Young School, um, you take two statistics classes and then there's this class that's kind of the capstone for those two. Um, and that's kind of the end of the line. Um, there is a Maymester class that I teach on data visualization where the whole semester is basically focused on ggplot, so you can do that. Um, but that's kind of the end of the line for this type of stuff in the Andrew Young School. Um, what book should you read next? I don't know. Um, it depends on what you're interested in. And so that is where my advice moves from the next thing you should do to be curious and teach yourself. Um, so the moral of this whole section is just play around with things and be curious about things. Um, so there's this fun tweet here that um, basically says that if you're an expert in something, it doesn't mean that you know everything about the topic. It just means that you're really good at Googling stuff. Um, and so with all of you, when you're asking me questions on Slack and with email, um, you often say like, I got an error, this is what the error says. 90% um, of the time, I just take the error that you send me and I put it into Google. And I've Googled different errors enough that I know, oh, it's this thing and then I can tell you what's wrong. I don't know that off the top of my head. I just do it because I've had lots of experience doing it. Um, that is expertise, which means you can also develop the same expertise if you're just kind of muddling through and playing with stuff and Googling stuff and trying stuff out and seeing why a model works, seeing why it doesn't work, seeing why a plot works, why a plot has colors in the specific place it does. Um, just playing with stuff is how you develop this expertise and being really good at Googling stuff. Um, that's why throughout the semester I keep saying like you do not need to type every line of code in R from memory. That's impossible. Um, you look at past examples. The reason I give you, I, I had you do all of these different problem sets is basically these problem sets are guides for future you on how to do a randomized control trial, on how to do inverse probability weighting, on how to do regression discontinuity, et cetera. You have kind of these standalone guides now, so two years from now, if you have to do regression discontinuity, you know what to do. You have a resource, you can go back to the resource, figure it out, and you're good to go. Um, that is expertise. Um, so the reason I taught you this way um, is because it enhances curiosity. That's been my goal throughout the semester here. Um, and it's related to this kind of contrarian take here. So Slate is famous for kind of having, having articles that seem really controversial, but they're not actually. And so this article here says like, I'm a developer, I won't teach my kids to code and neither should you. Kind of saying like, don't teach kids to code. And so if you look just at the headline, it basically sounds like this guy is anti-technology. He's not. What the article really talks about here is this idea here, that if we force kids to learn syntax. So if you say, kid, here is how ggplot works. You need to feed it a data set. You need to, fe you need to feed it the aesthetics. You have to tell it what the x column is, what the y, or what the x axis is, what the y axis is. You need to add a color aesthetic, et cetera, and then add a geom. And these are the mechanics of it, and that's all I will teach you. Neat, you can know about how ggplot works, but there's no spark to keep learning, and there's no spark to be curious and play around with stuff. And so what they say here in this article is just teaching you how to code by basically giving you a manual and saying, here's how you make a plot and ggplot. Um, that's not valuable. Anybody can learn syntax. Only kids, the article says, can learn to embrace curiosity. I don't agree with that. I think you can all be curious too. And lots of you have been doing that in your problem sets where you'll run a model and then you'll say, what happens if I throw in a different control variable? Or what happens if I make a plot and then add a line type aesthetic or a size aesthetic? What would happen then? So you're just playing with stuff. 
once you understand how the, how the exact syntax works, you can start adding new layers, you can add labels, you can add annotation layers, you can do all sorts of cool, fun stuff. And the goal is to have you do that. Um, the problem sets themselves have been structured that way. The initial problem sets were very much syntax heavy, where I gave you a chunk that was basically complete and you had to change like two things and then have an updated chunk. Um, with the last few problem sets, I've basically said, answer this question, insert as many chunks as you need, go. Um, because you're better at the syntax, but it's also a way for you to kind of pursue your curiosity and figure out how R works. So in general, if you want to get better at this stuff and to continue to learn R and causal inference and all of this evaluation stuff that you've learned, um, here's my two secrets for you. Find as many excuses as you can to use R and share your work and do all of your work in public. So perhaps start a blog, perhaps send your results to um, your friends and family and say, look at this cool thing I made. Um, there are things that you can do to kind of share the stuff that you're doing. And it's not just for your personal benefit. There are reasons for working in public. And we'll talk about each of these two secrets right now. Um, so first, if you want to get good at R, find excuses to use it, as many excuses as possible, um, and play with it. So if you have a, a class that is not my class, like nonprofit finance or something, and you have to do some sort of analysis, um, try doing it in R. Do it in Excel or whatever first, so you can make sure you have the right answers, but then try playing with it in R too and make a cool ggplot version of, of, of a graph or something, um, just because it gives you experience with this. Um, one of the things that I did when I was a PhD student and I took a causal inference class, um, the whole class was based in Stata. Um, I had no desire to ever really use Stata because it's expensive. Um, I did get Stata for free that semester, so I had Stata. Um, but I did every assignment both in Stata and in R. Um, and all of the answer keys were, were given out in Stata. And so I would basically take the answer key, translate it to R, and that's been the foundation for lots of the assignments for this class even, um, because I just wanted to find excuses for learning and using R, um, and so I just used it whenever possible. Even if you don't have to use R for specific assignments or anything, you can do little goofy things, um, little exploration projects. If you, um, I'll show some examples of this where you just decide to collect some data for fun and then stick it in the ggplot and show stuff with it. Um, on Twitter, there's this whole hashtag called Tidy Tuesday that's run in part from, I think it's our studio helps sponsor it. Um, basically, every Tuesday, um, I, somebody from the R community posts a data set and says, do something with it. And everybody on Twitter who uses R does something with it. Um, and you can do whatever. So some like sometimes there's data sets of like wine prices. And so people will run a regression model predicting wine prices. Some people will visualize wine prices over time with different types. So one person made like a dashboard of different, like an interactive dashboard of different wine prices and stuff. Basically, you just do whatever you want with the data and then post about it um, using the Tidy Tuesday hashtag there. Um, tons of people get into it. Um, Hadley Wickham, who um, is the author of ggplot and dplyr and most of the things in the tidyverse, um, he's done a couple where he just um, streams himself doing something with, with data. And so it, it's fun, like you can watch him, it's basically like watching somebody code on, or play a game on Twitch, but he's coding on Twitch. Um, so you see him download a data set, you see him start an RStudio project, you see him open it up and explore and do stuff and he's never seen the data before and you just kind of watch what he does and it's really really fascinating you learn stuff as people do this tidy tuesday stuff experts do it brand new beginners do it i recommend doing it search for tidy tuesday on face on twitter see what the most recent data set is and start just playing with it um, organizations have jumped on this. There are lots of um, nonprofits and government agencies and private companies that are heavily data focused where they'll essentially give their data analysts like a few hours a week to just play with data. So basically Tidy Tuesday, but you get paid for it. Um, and you just get to play with stuff and learn new things and teach yourself things. And so do that. Um, and then finally, actual projects. Again, like if you have some other class, 
try doing our stuff with it because that's how you're going to learn. Um, so this little exploration projects idea that I told you about, um, I have a folder on my computer called mini projects. It's just a bunch of stuff. Um, whenever I come across something interesting looking, I will do something with it. And then it's basically an art studio project. Um, so tidy Tuesday things that I participate in occasionally, they exist here. Um, a few years ago, um, somebody on Reddit posted a CSV file of every aggressive action that occurred in the Harry Potter books. Somehow somebody had coded every aggressive action and who was doing it to whom. Um, and so I saw that and was like, that looks neat. And I was in some really boring student council meeting and it was awful. And so during that meeting, I decided to just play with the data and I made this chart. Um, that shows the number of times different characters were aggressive in the Harry Potter series. And you can see who the most aggressive character is, and it is Harry. Harry Potter is the most aggressive person in the whole story. Um, even more than Voldemort, who's the main villain here. So Voldemort, in like the last book here, had 30 instance of, instances of, of aggression. Um, Harry and Hermione are like the two main good guys. Um, they were both incredibly aggressive there. Um, and so like that was just a fun little thing I did. I posted it to Reddit and then like it went semi-viral and I never use Reddit. That's the only thing I've ever used Reddit for. Um, but like it was a cool chart. But really that was just a way to play with R. I figured out how to add these white lines here instead of having like a grid line behind. I got a grid line on top. That's super cool. Um, but it was just a way of playing with data. Um, so I recommend doing that. Um, another thing I, we do mostly cause I'm like a super nerd is, um, we collect data in my family. Um, so we have like an annual goal of how many walks we want to do as a family, um, and how many books our kids want to read and other things like that. And then we use Google sheets and Google forms to track those. And so like when we get back from a walk, one of the kids is assigned to go write down the walk in a Google form, um, fun, nerdy thing to do. Um, but then I, the reason I did that was just so I could have data to play with for fun. And so this is our walks in 2014. We had a goal of doing 100 walks. And you can see the red line is kind of our cumulative number of walks. And the gray line here is what we should have done to stay on track to hit exactly 100 at the end. Um, and during school semester, we got behind because it's hard to go on walks when you're super busy. Um, and then once we were in the summer, we were okay. We noticed we were kind of behind track um, in mid-July. And so we like basically went on like multiple walks a day to, to boost that. And then it kind of plateaued. And then we were like, oh no, we're super behind. And we did a bunch. And then right here, right at the end of the year, we were behind. And so I think on New Year's Eve, um, we ended up doing like six or seven walks. We just like left the house and came home and then left the house again just so we could get to 100. And we did. Um, this is a stupid graph. The only reason I did it was just to like practice doing our stuff. Um, I figured out how to add these little tick marks at the bottom. It's called a rug plot. It shows the actual instances of walks there. So you can see they're all clustered here at July and October and January or December. Um, it was just a, a stupid way of playing with R. Um, same thing here. I had my daughter in 2014. Um, she was seven at that time. Um, she wrote down every book that she read in a Google form. And then at the end of the year, we analyzed it. And she read mostly books by JK Rowling and Nancy Krulik. That's Harry Potter. I have no idea what these books are, but she read a lot from Nancy Krulik, whoever that is. Um, so again, play with R as much as possible, find excuses to use it. And that's how you're going to learn how to do this stuff. Um, so that's my recommendation. That's my first recommendation for learning R and becoming an expert at this. Second, my second recommendation is to be as public as possible and as open as possible with the stuff that you do. Um, and there's a reason for this. It's because people can benefit from your work. And it's this notion of having radical transparency and public work. And so if you think about this timeline here, um, often this is how you think about your work and your goals, um, where you have some sort of idea you have for a final project in a class or something, you have some preliminary results, you have a draft manuscript, and then you don't show anybody your manuscript until it's done. 
and then that's when other people can see it and benefit from it and you turn it in and it's done. So nobody actually sees it until it's at the very end of the process. But what I recommend is we need to think about our work more like this, where if something is on your computer, it is not very valuable to the world. If something is not on your computer and is out in the world somehow, it is going to be a lot more valuable. Uh, meaning like share the stuff that you're doing. If you're working on some tricky plot and you figure out a cool way of adding like three different geom layers to show an effect, tweet about it um, and then post your code as a screenshot or something and then people will be able to see it and say, oh cool, that's something I can do. You're basically working in public. Um, that's one of the best ways that I've found to learn R is to just like tweet about my struggles with R, like this thing's not working. And I'll post the code and be like, this is so stupid, stupid R. And then people will be like, oh, you're missing a comma. And I'll be like, ah, oh, duh. Um, but like, that's totally normal. And it's a lot more valuable than just keeping everything on your computer. Um, the community as a whole benefits from your work. Um, and so there's all sorts of benefits you get from working in public. You build a reputation and people will come to know you as a person who does cool stuff. Um, it lets you learn more. Um, you come across other people's things um, and you can learn stuff. Um, it helps grow the community. It encourages other people to post their work and um, their different examples and explorations. Um, it lets you get early feedback on your ideas. Um, if you're trying something out and it's like going to be a dead end is gonna, and is gonna be bad, then somebody might say like, that's not gonna work. Here, try this instead. Um, it gives you validation for your work. Some people will be like, this is awesome stuff you're doing. And you get like the serotonin bump of like having people say, cool, great work. Um, so there are benefits to working in public. Um, this has been my strategy for developing our skills as well is all those examples I showed of like family walks and number of books read and stuff, um, those I tweeted out and it was like kind of embarrassing because it was like the super nerdy thing like tracking walks through a Google form. But it was like kind of cool because people saw like, oh, people are doing fun things with data. I can try that too. Um, I think I actually got the idea of doing that from somebody else who tweeted about like tracking workouts or walks or something. And I was like, I can do that too. Um, so one thing I have, I have a personal blog. If you go to andrewheist.com, there's a blog there. Um, and I use that mostly for working out questions in public. Um, so, and just like showing different pieces of code that I figure out in public. Um, so for instance, when I was offered this job at GSU in uh, November 2019, 2018, November 2018, I was finally offered a job. It took three years of being on the academic job market to be able to get this offer. And so what I did is the whole time I was applying for jobs, um, different academic jobs, I kept a spreadsheet of all of the different jobs I was applying to. Um, in part so I could remember what I was applying to, but in part because collecting data is fun because I'm a nerd. Um, and so what I did at the end of that process is I was able to just kind of play with the data and see how the academic job market worked um, and how miserable it was. So if you look here, the very first year I was on the cycle, every one of these squares here is where I applied to a university and heard nothing back from them. Um, so that's a lot of gray squares and it was miserable. Um, these yellow dots or these yellow squares are schools that I had a Skype interview with, but then did not fly out to the school for an additional in-person interview. Um, and as you can see, that very first cycle, I only flew out to one place. That was a bad year. Um, and then I got an offer, um, uh, technically two places. I flew out to BYU too, but that was my BYU offer there. The second year... I applied to a bunch of places again. I actually had lots of flyouts that year, five different flyouts. But notice how none of them were offers. That was a bad year too. Um, and then here, the last year I was on the market, still, I only had one flyout. Um, and it was to GSU, and that's why I'm here. Um, but what was cool about this is it, it's basically a blog post where I was just saying like, here's how bad the academic job market is. This is pre-pandemic too. It is like a billion times worse right now. Um, so it was mostly just exploring my own data that I had collected, but 
um, in the op in the spirit of transparency, I made it open source. And so there's actual code for it. Um, so I wrote this all in R Markdown, so it looks like a fancy blog post, but um, it has all of the code here for making all of those charts. And so people have been able to adapt um, my data for their own stuff, which is cool. Um, and so as a result, um, oddly enough, um, this kind of went viral-ish as much as you can in like the R world. Um, but lots of people saw it and I was invited last in 2019, I was invited to go talk to the epidemiology PhD students at the University of Georgia about failure and how to cope with failure. And I've talked at a couple other places about failure. So because of this blog post here and working in public and sharing my code, um, I've become known as like the failure guy, um, which is a great um, thing for me to be an expert in, yay. Um, so I'm the failure guy and the, the data viz guy, I guess. Yay. Um, so in general, do stuff like that. Work in public. Tweet the stuff that you do. Blog about the stuff that you do. Play with data in public. If you find some data set, do stuff with it and then tell people what you did with it. Teach concepts um, that you want to teach other people. Um, but also teach yourself things. One of the assignments I used to do in this class, um, I didn't this time around because we're completely asynchronous. Had we been in person, this would have been an assignment where you would have to basically write a blog post teaching somebody how to do something in R. Um, basically doing what is called a code through where you say, here's a data set, I want to show how to make a histogram. And then you make a histogram and then you say, here's how you can add a border to it. Here's how you can change the bin width. Here's how you can do whatever. Um, so that used to be an assignment. Sadly, we didn't do it this time around, but it, you can do that. Um, and it is very useful because it, again, builds the community and helps other people learn and helps you learn. Um, there are all sorts of communities out there that can benefit from your public work. Um, one of the biggest and most welcoming and kind of best ones out there is on Twitter. Um, this rstats hashtag, if you do anything with R, use that hashtag. If you want to find resources, search for that hashtag. Um, it's just super nice, welcoming, happy community. Like, use them. It's cool. Um, there are in-person groups called R user groups that meet once a month-ish, and they invite people from the local community to basically give a short talk or demonstration about something in R, and so you can meet other people who use this stuff. Um, Atlanta has one. They haven't met in a while, I think since 2018. Um, they were thinking about restarting, but then the pandemic happened, so I don't know what the current status of that is, but like you can look for those groups. Um, there's also a hashtag called Our Ladies um, that is focused on getting women more involved in data science, specifically around R, and that's a really welcoming, great community. Check them out. Um, there are ways of publishing your R Markdown files onto the internet. Um, you, when you knit to HTML in R Studio, it'll give you an R, it'll give you an HTML preview. Up in the top right corner of that window, you can click on a button that will let you publish that HTML file to the internet. And it'll give you a URL and you can share that URL with people. And so it's basically a way of like putting stuff online without even creating a blog, without even creating a special website or anything. You just click on a button and you have your HTML file online, which is really, really cool. Um, because then you can share that with whoever. Um, so I'd recommend doing that um, if you're just getting started with this. There are other ways of doing it too. You can um, create entire websites. Um, you can create books. You can create blogs with packages, this blog down package. This course website that you've used throughout the semester is built using blog down, which just takes a whole bunch of our markdown files and knits them all together into a big website. And that's, that's how the course website works. Um, so some things that you can do is this idea of playing with data in public. Um, a few years ago, there was a data set that came out that shows um, democracy scores of different countries over time um, called the Polity 4 Project that's popular in the political science world. Um, so they released their scores in uh, up to 2016. Um, that includes kind of 2017. And so what I wanted to do was to see if there was a, a 2016 effect um, from the 2016 elections. And so I figured out how to... Um, download a data set programmatically 
uh, instead of like going and right clicking on a on a CSV file and downloading it, I decided I wanted to figure out how to use R to download it. And I figured it out just for fun. Um, and then I made a picture of it and then basically just posted the process on the blog saying, here's how you can download stuff and here's a picture. Um, mostly for my own reference. So now if I ever want to do that again, I have kind of a place to look and it's neat. Um, but other people can benefit from it too. Um, this other thing I have here, um, I was just curious um, about text analysis because one of my friends published a book about how to do text analysis with R. So I was like, I can do that. So I decided to just start playing around with stuff. Um, and so I fed it like the Quran and I fed it like the New Testament and just did different um, text analysis things because I could and it, it was fun and, and stuff. Um, nothing publishable is there. That was just a way of playing with data in public. But lots of people have been able to, to use that same code to do like real stuff instead of just play pictures. Um, or I have this fun blog post where this is really just reference for me. Um, a bunch of different ways to measure the difference in groups. Um, in stats, you learn this as a t-test. Um, you do this with like um, randomized control trials. If you want to see the difference in outcome for treatment and control groups, you want to figure out the difference in means. There are a bunch of different ways of doing it, either with a t-test or with simulation or with Bayesian statistics. And I just wanted to keep track of all of the different ways you could do it. And so I made a blog post that basically says, here are six different ways of measuring the difference in groups. And it's just mostly a reference for me, but lots of other people look at this. Um, and it's a cool thing that you can do. Um, working in public is super helpful too because other people will see your stuff and then they'll assume you're an expert, um, even if you're not necessarily. Um, for instance, that chapter I had you read on causal inference um, that was uh, part of an R for political science um, textbook um, where I just covered like how DAGs work, how DAGity works, and how to do inverse probability weighting and matching. So that, that PDF that you read. Um, that was because I did a blog post about how to adjust using inverse probability weighting because I wanted to figure it out for myself finally because um, I'd been reading about it and I still had no clue how it works. And so I just like blogged about it and said, here's how it will work. Here's some fake data. Here's how you actually do it, I think. And I posted it and some other people were like, oh, you're doing this part wrong. And so I fixed it. But then like the author, the editor of that one book for R for Political Science found that blog post and was like, I want this to be a chapter. And so they invited me to write a chapter version of it, um, which is cool. So I did, you read that chapter. I'm hardly an expert in this stuff, but it, it went through um, in part because I was working publicly and that's super cool. So again, like try to make your work public because people will benefit from it um, and it improves the whole community. Um, Final example of this, um, I teach a microeconomics class um, here at the Andrew Young School. Um, and what I wanted to do there was to create all of the microeconomics graphics, because there's lots of them with like supply curves and demand curves and indifference curves. I wanted to plot those using R, because ggplot is a cool plotting system. And so I figured out how to do like derivatives and calculus with R so you can get indifference curves that line up so you can maximize budgets and um, maximize utility using budget lines and indifference curves and stuff. Um, and then I just posted about it as kind of a reference for me. Um, but lots of other people have been able to do similar things. I think at this point, somebody's made a whole R package for making econ plots, um, which is cool. I don't use it. I still do it all the way I figured it out, but it's spurred on other things. So moral of the story is work in public as much as possible because the community will benefit from that and you will benefit from that specifically um, and just stay curious when you come across some data set play with it um, download it just play around with it collect your own data on stupid things like the number of family blocks you have whatever um, just find excuses to use R get involved in the community um, get involved in program evaluation communities there there are program evaluators on Twitter specifically um, that are very, very nice and welcoming. Um, just get involved, work publicly, and embrace your curiosity. Um, at this point, you are all expert enough in this stuff. Um, you can't do do calculus by hand. I can't do that. Um, you 
are not super experts at diff and diff or regression discontinuity, but you're good enough to Google stuff and to understand the, the policy papers that you read and to be able to do this on your own. And that is good enough for the sake of this class. Um, continue to learn it, continue to embrace your curiosity, play with this stuff. Um, you're expert enough to be curious and to play. And so my final parting words for you are go out and do causal inference stuff. You know enough and you can do this correctly and so go do it and become the next generation of causal inference people.